that China is powerful and insecure. As the feature of rampant misconception. India and China cannot go to war. That informal summits has its own limitation. Common strand of Buddhism. Hello and welcome to India-China Scholars Dialogue. Today our guest is Mr. Prem Shankar Jha. Mr. Prem Shankar Jha needs no introduction. He is one of India's finest political and foreign affairs analysts. His remarkable professional journey includes working with UNDP, the World Bank and UN Center for Human Settlement and the World Commission on Environment and Development. But most importantly, he has been the editor of top national dailies of India, the Economic Times, Financial Express, the Hindu Time Times and the Times of India. He was the media advisor to Prime Minister V.P. Singh. Mr. Jha has written several books, three of them on political economies of India and China. Welcome to the dialogue, Mr. Jha. Let me start with uh, one of your recent articles on India-China relations. Uh, you wrote that uh, the Indian public has been fed a diet of half-truth about relationship with China. That has become serious impediment to peace with China. Uh, what do you mean by half-truth? I think you, we do not remember that China and India had for hundreds, in fact, two millennia. And the relations were based upon the fact that we were two parallel civilized civilizations which had uh, the common strand of Buddhism. The connections between the Mauryan Empire and, 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 and the, uh, the Qin Dynasty in, in, in China are, are well known. Uh, and from that point on, there's been a great deal of historical research on that. All this turned upside down after Indian independence and after China, China became, became a communist power. Now, that is to say within the period between 1947 and 1950. And we have since then been in a state of hostility with each other. Uh, as you know, a part of the reason was the Chinese takeover of, over of Tibet, which caused great anxiety in India, uh, because Tibet for all practical purposes had been a an independent country for, for the previous 30 to 40 years. But it became much worse after that when the Chinese, we found the Chinese were building a road through Tibet to connect Xinjiang to the rest of the country via Tibet. That was without telling us. The problem there was, of course, that the Chinese did not recognize Aksai Chin, the area of Tibet in which this road was being built as being a part of India. India wanted except, uh, thought of it as being part of India and it's ma marked in all the maps even today uh, because this was a line drawn by the, uh, by the British for their purposes basically because they were afraid of Russian expansion southwards in the 19th century. It was the line drawn in about, in about 1865. Uh, I think it's called the McCarthy McDonald line. Um, although it's the Johnson line. So I beg your pardon, the Johnson line. Now, the whole problem has been, how do we settle this? We have not been able to settle this on, on through the discussion. It's been settled through a process of acquiring territory in Aksai Chin. And from that, as you know, 1962 war began. 1962 war, the, the half-truths that you, you are talking about relate to the things that happened after 1962. First and foremost, of course, there is the fact that war did not start on October 20th. It started with an order by Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru um, to throw the Chinese off the Thagla Ridge, Thagla Ridge in eastern, in, in what is now Arunachal Pradesh, on October 10th. And there were some initial skirmishes uh, in one of which the Ch Chinese uh, were, were driven away. And um, then we, the, the, the Prime Minister Nehru said, get them off the, the Thakla Ridge, upon which the Chinese counterattacked, and that was in, on October 20th. Now, these facts are not generally known in India because there's a, a very important report, the Henderson Brooks report, uh, which was written by General Henderson Brooks, who was in the Indian Army then, but the, his, his co author and man who really did the work, Brigadier Prem Bhagat who was one of the three Indian officers to have won the Victoria Cross in the Second World War. 
Um, that report was banned immediately after it came out in 1963 and has been is officially banned even till today because it tells you the correct the picture of what, how that war started. And in that correct picture, it makes it very clear. First, uh, military steps taken were by India 10 days before October 20th. This is only the first of several, um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, things that have been, uh, the false ideas that have been presented to the Indian public. Based upon the October 20th idea that the war, they started the war, a whole series of theories have been developed about China's aggressiveness, its imperial attitude, its, um, its, its desire to swallow more territory in the Himalayas and so on, Indian occupied, occupied Indian territory. All that went on until 1993, when we were able to sign the agreement on peace and tranquility in the border regions with the Chinese. As you know, we had a bad defeat in, 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 in 1962. And that's the second reason why the Henderson Books report was was, was, it was uh, concealed or uh, banned. But the Henson Brooks report is now out. In 2013, one copy of it, the only copy that was given to a time, London Times journalist, Neville Maxwell, with the promise to keep it secret for 50 years. 50 years were over and he put it up on, on the internet. And now large numbers of copies of that are available all over all over the country. And what I'm speaking from is actually from the original report. Now, this changes the whole picture on China-India relations. And uh, I think that it is th th there that capacity to build friendship back again with China has been destroyed by our not knowing the truth. Uh, but once the, the Henderson report was public, was it not debated publicly in India and especially in China? Uh, you're saying there's no discussion of the report? No, there's plenty among Chinese scholars. They take it for granted. To start off with, Neville Maxwell wrote a book called India's China War, which is, I think, biased to be truth. To, to be truthful, he has not taken many factors into account, including the Chinese invasion of Tibet, including the lack of courtesy, knowing perfectly well that there was a border dispute. They should have at least talked to Nehru first to the Indian government first, they said, look, this is what we are doing. Do you have any objection? And Nehru would have immediately said, no, we'll create a, a zone around which, because as he said, not even a blade of grass grows there. But that they didn't allow that to happen. The Chinese bumbled and fumbled very badly. But the fact ultimately remains that the basic truth that this was a dispute caused by our acceptance of a colonial legacy, which the Chinese re explicitly rejected, this basic truth was there in the in, in the uh, Henderson Books report, plus the fact that actually we started the, started the thing. Um, there's much more that I can tell you. That is all in Neville Maxwell's India-China War. Um, so, if, if you, I'm sure there are many Chinese books on this. I'm sure that you do not have access to all of them. But this is now common uh, common knowledge, and you can go on the website. Anybody can go on the website and and pull out the Henderson Books report. It's there now. If we don't discuss it, it's our fault. There's a feeling in India and more recently in China that both countries being big influential nations sharing the border and India and China are natural ad adversaries or competitors. Thus, conflict between them is inevitable. What will you say for that? First and foremost, again, that is the half-truth. That's precisely the kind of thing I'm talking about. There, this. We are convinced in India that China is our natural enemy. We forget history. We remember only our defeat in 1962. We blame the Chinese for being the aggressors. And therefore, we, we then concoct theories to explain why the Chinese are being aggressive. In the case of the Chinese, in his book, Jay Shankar, the foreign minister, has written about, about, about China, that the sense of hostility Built inbuilt hostility towards uh, towards China that we have in India is not reflected in China. Even he has said that, and I have made many visits to China from 1985 onwards and written three books on China, and uh, and I have I have not also found found this. But most important of all, if you look at this the conflict that took place in Ladakh this time, you you will see one thing. 
the chinese moved forward and stayed up to their definition of their their definition of the line of control line of actual control they did not move beyond that into into what is indisputably indian territory if they had wanted territory or they had wanted to teach us a lesson or to prove their enmity their superiority towards over india towards the whole of the whole of the world you would you would have had a situation where they would have, when we were caught napping they would have taken whatever they wanted we know very clearly that they are worried about dolat begoldi they are worried about the road that is being built along the shayok river if they, they want to occupy the heights above that the commanding heights above that as they have tried to do in in, in pangong lake but the, the fact is that they came up to a certain point and stopped and the reason was the only explanation as we have now found correctly after 11 rounds of of talks is that they wanted a political reconfirmation of the agreements that we have had with them between 1993 and 2005 which clearly define how we will deal with maintain peace in this border region one of the big problems we have is that india insists on trying to draw a border line the chinese are very uncomfortable with that they have 24 border border disputes of which 23 are settled and um the 24th is with india uh, and in the in the in, in 15 out of the remaining 23 they have not drawn a line and the other side has accepted we are the, the one country which is not ex- accepting this and is continually trying to draw a line and um that was the, the problem that has been sort of dogging us since 1993 when the agreement was signed so sir are you saying that india china conflict is not merely a border issue but also technicalities of settlement of the border or there is something else to it i think so. you you are right about that 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 something else is why do they want to talk to us rather than just simply take the territory they want because they want india's strategic support cooperation on international issues this has been the chinese position right from 2009 um in 2009 there was a meeting between prime minister manmohan singh and premier wen jiabao at hua hin on the sidelines of the asia pacific economic conference in thailand they had spent two days together it was a meeting in which all kinds of misunderstandings and things were removed and an agreement was reached on how they would move forward again a reaffirmation of two pre- previous agreements one was the 1993 agreement and the most important one was an agreement of the principles for the settlement of this dispute uh, in 2005 both of which had stressed that a, an important part of the reason for our wanting peace there is that we need to cooperate on international strategic issues those strategic issues range all the way from climate change to the most important issue today which is the hegemonic struggle between the USA and and, and now an emerging China and which is basically a, a struggle between the past hegemonic master of the world whose economic strength has been declining and a new large country very large country whose economic strength worldwide has been has been growing and the chinese do not want us to be on the wrong side and they have wanted us always to be on their side now one last thing before you ask the next question what is the issue on which they want co- strategic cooperation with india it is on whether there should be a unipolar world i e uh, the post cold war world whether it should be dominated by the us which quote and quote won the cold war i think he providing us or should it be a multipolar world in which several countries and particularly the larger countries work together to make sure that there is peace exactly as has been foreseen and was there in the un charter it was in this that they wanted uh, india to be a part and since that was our policy right from the start mm-hmm. and since the tibetan issue had been completely settled in 2009 and in 2009 there were very important significant things that the chinese did which showed 
that they were not interested in pushing the Himalayan border issue in the east. There was only a little bit of Ladakh left. All these things had, had already been done by, two, by 2014 when uh, President Xi Jinping was coming to India. What happened was Xi Jinping expecting that he would, that this strategic cooperation authority upon it in that meeting found that he had a different prime minister who had already decided to join the USA. And so the whole, it's from then that uh, the entire relationship that had been built between 1993 and 2009 by the Narasimha Rao government, then the Vajpayee government, and then by the Manmohan Singh government, three governments in China, began to be unraveled and they were unraveled by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi personally when he went to Washington 10 days after meeting Xi Jinping. Sir, as you say, uh, that China always want India to be on his side. Uh, they also want a multipolar world. They also realize that India is a large and growing country and would be an important partner for China if they want to lead the Asia or influence the world. Then why don't they support India, such as in UNSC or uh, Nuclear Suppliers Group? Uh, they were even reluctant to sanction Azhar Masood. So it appears to Indians that China oppose India uh, wherever they can. Sahib Sahib, uh, this is a very important question and I'm very glad you asked it. Then first, let us see what the strategic cooperation was about. The Chinese say, the Iranians say, and our government and Mr. Jay Shankar says, we now live in a totally interconnected, economically interconnected world. And in such a world, there, war is not a solution to any problem any longer. There are no winners in a war, only losers. And every single country that has started a war, not only now but in the, in the, in the 20th century, has not gained from it. The last war where you could say somebody gained something from it actually in terms of territorial authority or conquest was the Second World War. After that, as it, because we are so too tightly interconnected with each other in first trade and now in communications, the moment war breaks out, it disrupts all this. It impoverishes, it creates huge unemployment, and there are no winners in the end. Now, the Chinese have the strongest motive for making others accept and join them in this concept of the world. Why? Because they are the most powerful trading partner in the country in the world. The combined reserves of the central banks, of the euro, the dollar, and the pound, are about $400 billion. The sovereign reserves of China are $3.8 trillion, a thousand times more. Now, this Chinese are investing this all over the world because it's a surplus capital. It's to build influence. There's no question at all about that. But in the end, it is also building infrastructure, railways, roads, ports, etc. In 85 separate projects already, there may be more by now, uh, including five in the US. Why are they doing that? They're doing that to facilitate uh, the maximum expansion of trade, both in goods as well as in services. But at this moment, it's mainly goods. Now, the thing about trade is that it's a very delicate thing. The slightest hint of war and trade stops. If there's any threat in the Malacca Straits, ships will stop going through it. You know that 150,000 ships, large ships, pass through the Malacca Straits every year, carrying about 90% of the oil that China consumes, among other things, and 40% of its exports. Now, this gives China a very, very strong reason for avoiding war, the strongest reason in the world. But at the same time, it gives any country that wants to disrupt China's rise, the strongest of possible reasons for pulling China into a war. The US, I'm sorry to say this because I, I have great respect for the US in other respects, all kinds of ways, historically and also in terms of its present achievements. But the fact is the US today is a declining economic power, you know, and they are also the hegemony is under pressure from China. And they have the strongest motive for somehow disrupting this China's growth. And a small war in which their soldiers are not involved would be the perfect thing. And the only candidate, candidate there is is India. Why? Because take the Quad. In the Quad, there's Japan. Japan has 11,000 
Japanese enterprises working in China. Yeah. Uh, employing 23 million J Chinese. Japan will never declare war, never allow a war to it, it in China. Within the court, Japan will always take a position saying, short of war, short of blockades, short of trying to prevent Chinese trade. The Australian's largest trading partner, both for imports and exports, is also China. But we are tiny in that respect. And Ladakh is perfect because it's an area where you can have a war without too much loss to either side. But sir, does not, doesn't India understand this game? Why India is pulling into US-China supremacy war? India knows as a next door neighbor how important are its relationship with China. Historically also, India never trusted USA. Then why India does not want to be with China? First and foremost, it's not India. It is the Modi government and only the Modi government. Let's be very, very clear on this. After Hua Hin, there is an organization called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. BRICS was formed first only as Russia, India, China, Yekaterinburg in 2008 in Russia as a consultative body precisely for the idea of promoting another idea of how the international order should be established after the Cold War. Then Brazil joined and, and South Africa also joined. The first meeting of BRICS, was no, which was political and not economic, took place in 2011 in Sanya in, in, in China. It's a resort in China. And that had a political content because that was the year in which the US and in NATO both attacked and destroyed Libya and then attacked Syria and nearly destroyed Syria without any kind of sanction from the UN Security Council. They also attacked Lebanon, by the way, and forced a solution which did not last on Lebanon. But the question is, this was the first time that you saw that the most powerful country in the world is determined to break down the old, the, the order that it itself created. The UN Charter itself is the finest, most sophisticated form of the Westphalian international order in which war is always the last resort. Now, they broke that so that in Sanya this was criticized. Then there was most important meeting was held in Delhi in 2012. In that 2012 meeting, it's a, there's a very long declaration in which we explicitly condemned the attacks of Libya and, and Syria. We explicitly said that there can be no unipolar world order. We explicitly said that we will work together multipolar world order and various other things like that. And that we will set up a bank, which eventually came up, but in a very small way, which would obviously trade in Renminbi. Now, this is another issue. I don't want to go into that. That's the even bigger threat to the West. And it doesn't talk about it because it's such a big threat. But that's another issue. So 2012, we have come to the peak on this. 2013, Li Keqiang came to India. But before that, Xi Jinping became president. The first thing he said on meeting Manmohan Singh was, I want to settle the border dispute as early as possible. He sent his Prime Minister Li Keqiang to India. There was a wonderful meeting between the, him and Manmohan Singh. I have some details of that meeting. But after that, Xi Jinping paid his, was paying his first state visit, if I'm not mistaken, to India. May have been his second. Xi Jinping, before he came, announced that China intended to in, invest six hundred billion dollars in Indian infrastructure in the next five years. Six hundred billion dollars. That you know, there, there there are two people who have said made the statement. One is NK Doval in Beijing, mm. and the second is, is is China's Consul General in Bombay before Xi Jinping came. That whole thing went up in the air because Mr. Modi never talked anything serious with Xi Jinping. They talked only about this incursion which had been planned by the local Tibetan command in Ladakh, if you remember. Mm. Um, anyway, whatever it was, atmospherics were still very good. But 10 days later, after this visit, Mr. Modi goes to Washington and he agrees to sign the Joint Strategic Vision for Asia and the Indo-Pacific, that is now called, used to be called the West Pacific um, earlier, um, Southwest Pacific. Obama breaks all protocol. Three months later, he comes to India. On January 25th, um, 2015, signs this. 
and we all agree, we agree also to just sign quickly all the three military agreements which make, make us an ally of the US, whether we like it or not. Because the logistical agreements, it means that the US can use any base anywhere within in India or outside India to launch any kind of attack it wants, subject only to our agreement. An agreement not being given is unlikely at the best of times. Because it would extract a very high price. So why Modi government has become so pro-USA? While historically, India have been more Asia-centric, talking about Asian centuries and creating institutions like BRICS and AIIB with China. Uh, then what changed Mr. Modi's mind? Modi came with a purely internal point of vision. His vision was to make an India Hindutva state. And the first thing was he wanted Credit, credit for a new India must go entirely to the RSS and to make a new India, you must destroy the old India or, you know, and you, where do you start most easily? You start in, 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 in international relations because it's the easiest thing to do. And that's precisely what happened. Mr. Modi uh, went to US. There was a joint editorial by him and Obama, which appeared in the Washington Post on November 30th. Uh, in the Washington Post, the day it was November 1st. And he the joint editorial was all about international cooperation on piracy, trade, etc., etc., information technology, and so on. When the meeting finished and, came, and, and they came out, the next morning, there was no mention of all this. The Indian, the Indian uh, embassy issued a brief note on the contents of, of that meeting, and it said that India and the US um, agreed to cooperate on international issues concerning the um, maintenance of international order and observance of laws. Exact words, I cannot remember, but that is all it was. And 10 days later, um, uh, uh, Mr. Obama, he came to India and this signed the Joint Strategic Vision in which the only significant clause was that we will determine to observe the law of the sea on, and freedom of transit in the South China Sea. Freedom of transit means what? Not commercial transit military transit. And the law of the sea gives you an exclusive zone of only 12 miles, 20 kilometers. Now, what had been bothering the worrying the Chinese is that while 40% of their trade go, goes through the Malacca Straits, 100% of it passes out of the South China Sea, either northwards towards Japan and then America, or southwards towards Asia and Europe. 100%. So the Chinese had early, earlier said, we want to preserve this of at any cost. So please, the notification was that if you want to send military aircraft or military naval craft, naval craft, please give us advance notice. This is to avoid any kind of conflict emerging. Okay, uh, this was strongly resented by the Americans. They said you must stick to the law of the sea, a rule-based international order is the phrase that they use, and which we have also accepted. And from that point on, if things be began to get bad, but what we did was in 2016, we sent four Indian warships to join a US-Japan you know, task force to patrol the South China Sea and enforce the freedom of navigation, i.e. go well within the area that the Chinese were, were talking about and up to 12 miles from the coast, coastline. Now, this was, shall we say, to put it mildly, a hostile act. But the Chinese did not react. They actually blamed the US, saying, you are trying to divide friends like the old imperialists of old days, divided rule is your policy. In short, they were very careful in every statement. I've written a great deal on this. Every statement that they made from 2015, 16, 16 onwards, they very carefully avoided putting the blame on India and put the blame on America. Until Dokla. Um, they, why are they against us on Masood Azhar and all kinds of things related to China? To China? To, to, to Pakistan. The reason is the China Park Economic Corridor. The Ch we think that the China Park Economic Corridor is a part of an encirclement of India, uh, you know, policy of theirs. For them, that, that economic corridor is crucially important because should the Malacca Straits ever be closed, this will be their only way of getting oil. I want to remind you of something, Sakusa. In June 1940, the Americans declared a complete embargo on the supply of oil to Japan for reasons connected with the way their so-called misbehavior during the Great Depression. That was the American reading. Japanese 
at that point depended for on oil for 90% of the energy that the industry used. The only response that the Japan, Japanese could make to this was they sent a Japanese fleet under Admiral Yamashita and they conquered Indonesia because Indonesia was the only part of Asia at which at that time in which oil was being produced. That was the beginning of the Second World War and the involvement of Japan. China knows this very well. I mean, it's right at their doorstep. So what they want is please stay further away I mean, we need to have a broader zone and they, they call that the nine dash line. I don't accept the nine dash line. I wouldn't accept any unilateral uh, statement by any country, but we need to understand what they were trying to do. Their problem is that today's uh, you know, aircraft carriers and military, I think the right way to go around that, go about that would have been for them to bring, the, bring up this issue in BRICS, get a consensus on this, lay out this, but the Chinese, particularly the, the, the armed forces, are strange. They are extremely reluctant to ever admit any kind of vulnerability. For them, we are the, we are the middle kingdom. We are great. We are there. There's that whole militaristic, this wolf warrior kind of tradition also in China, which is their own worst enemy. But we, might, we need to be adults in India and to distinguish where they are just thumping their chests and where their real interests lie. And we don't do that. We, they thump their chest. We get so frightened. We start running, into, running to the US. Start running to somebody else. The Chinese do not want war. Srinath Raghavan, who I think the finest Indian writer on foreign policy, has written categorically that China has the strongest interest in the maintenance of world peace today because its entire growth is based on trade, and trade is destroyed by war. But isn't peace important for India as well? At the current level of economic development, with large young population, with huge potential of economic growth, shouldn't development be our priority over conflict with China? Actually, let, let's be fair to our, to our thinkers. Because of the, the calculated lying to the Indian public, done through the concealment of the Henderson Books Report, not allowing Indian writers to discuss this at length, and absorb, allow the discussion to create a balanced picture in India of what had actually happened in 62. We have been always on the defensive. The hostility is entirely in us. We, we feel humiliated. We would not feel humiliated if we realized that this was a huge misstep by Pandit Nehru. In fact, again, Jayashankar mentions that in his book without saying precisely what it was. And Jayashankar is not whatever he is. Foreign Minister of BJP, but he is not a person who is anti-Congress or anti-India or anti-Gandhi or anything like that. He's, he's just, he's a good Indian. So, you know, the question is that I think we need to recognize that one lie breeds a million lies or half-truths. The Chinese are perfectly capable of being aggressive, but with India, they wanted cooperation. They wanted cooperation because India is big. India has this soft power a democracy, a peaceful country that has never threatened any other country around it, you know, which can, in fact, act as the buffer, even inside Quad. I would say that's the best role that India can play inside Quad, is to be the buffer and along with, with Japan and, and Australia, make sure that the Quad is entirely constructive in its approach to peace. Do you think Quad is a serious initiative? Mr. Jayashankar has said that Quad is not a nation, an Asian NATO. And he's quite right. Quad is not and is not intended to be, not by the US. The US would like that. The US has been pushing it. But US can only push Japan and Australia so far. And US can also only push us so far. If Mr. Modi starts playing big, dramatic, militarily dramatic, and brings up military issues in Quad, it will be in order to show the, how what a powerful leader he is at home to the Indian people. Because we've created an atmosphere in which anything, any fist you wave at China makes you a strong leader. We have, we have such a huge inferiority complex towards China today. But the Chinese have enormous respect for India yeah. based upon the past. Uh, U.S. wants India to play a very active and prominent role in Quad. Uh, do you think it will affect India's role in other organizations such as BRICS and SEO? I think that is a very good question. I, I, I worry, wonder and worry about it. Much will depend upon the positions we take within Quad 
at other meetings, all of it will get warm. If we are ambivalent about and make, um, shall we say, aggressive or from the Chinese point of view, threatening kind of, any threatening move from Quad, a threat, for example, if you do if you do this, we will do that and India becomes a part of it, then the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS will both be dead. What you will then see emerge, two front coalition in which we will be the victims throughout. You are already seeing Russia, China and Iran coming together. This occupies the whole three quarters of the land surface of the world. We then become a little tail at the bottom, mm. protected only by the Himalayas, which is not very much of a protection any longer. You know, we will have extreme Islamic states to the west of us, and we will have states to the right of us, which are brilliant at playing the game of being with China and being with the US at the same time and trading with both and becoming rich. And they will not join us or stand moves towards China. Uh, there is a talk about emerging new world order. You see new friendships are emerging like Russia, China, India, Pakistan, a little bit of Qatar and others. Also talks about trade in RMB. Is it real uh, new development or just a temporary phenomenon? And, and the money is all there. Which, which is the richest single country apart from China with the biggest reserves? It happens to be Qatar. Which is the country with the maximum oil reserves today? Iran. Even Saudi Arabia's the, the big elephant is great. The, that massive, unbelievable find that they had is running out. Now, oil is not that important because, you know, it, it's oil, the oil, oil's importance will diminish with other forms of transport fuels coming up. Uh, biofuels, electric uh, transportation and so on. But nonetheless, it is still for at least the next 20 or 30 years going to be a, the most pivotal issue in, in, in international trade and in, in uh, politics and, and, and diplomacy. So and there it's all, we are out of that picture. We've let down Iran. That is of no, no help at all. India is isolating itself. And it's isolating itself when China says, for God's sake, join us. If India becomes part of this group at some point, with this, this government or the next government, you will genuinely have the multipolar world, whether you like it or not. That will be the end of American hegemony in terms of territory. There is another form of hegemony, which is financial hegemony, where the four currencies, euro, dollar, yen, and pound, together form the reserve currency of the world. And everyone keeps their savings in those currencies. That will be contested by China, will be contested later. And I'm sure that will be very easily over. There will be kind of a struggle, but it will not be a violent struggle. And it will be settled quite easily between the central banks. And yeah, I'm not worried too much about that. That's the second stage of the consolidation of Chinese hegemony, economic hegemony. But today, the political hegemony issue is that there should be a multipolar world, is what we have the power to either push or to uh, slow down or even prevent. But if we do, sooner or later, the world will be at war. And how does that help? And if India has the power, the capacity, because of its size, because of its democracy, because of its innate peaceability, say, hold it, we don't want war, we won't war with any country, we won't go along with this. We see this country's point of view, therefore let's find another solution. If, we, if India on the, on the western side, on one side of the divide, can be the middle power, Whereas there are on the other side of the divide, also middle powers. We will be able to eventually create a new world order, which will ensure peace. We are not there yet. That is the role that we can play. I'm not against India being part of Quad. The question is, being part of Quad, does India have the guts and the self-confidence to assert itself in the way that it can in the maintenance of peace, instead of being dragged by the Americans or some, some idiot country, some Eastern European country, via the NATO, because the NATO is one of these awful things where if they, they have a treaty saying if one member attacks, it's an attack on all. So all you need to do is to trigger an attack on one member and the whole of NATO gets into a war, whether they like it or not. That's exactly how the First World War began, by the way. So basically, you are an economist and have done tremendous work on economy. I wanted to know about your views on BRI. India did not join BRI. The reason basically was CPEC. But now BRI has become a huge economic initiative. It is a trillion dollar project. More than 100 countries have already joined it. 
including the countries with whom traditionally we had a very strong business links. So do you think BRI might affect uh, Indian relationship or business relationship with those countries or India might edged out of the business because of because of uh, uh, BRI projects are there? They can edge us out of any market anytime they like. They have superior technology, lower costs, tremendously in larger capacity to mass produce than we do. Um, I think that there is this, this is not this is not new. This is not this has been true for a very long time. As export-led economies, India is a failure, and China is the outstanding, unexpected, unbelievable success of the world. I mean, there were other export-led economies after all. European countries became in, in the post Second World World War years, the years of the Cold War. Euro- European countries developed rapidly by being export oriented also. But um, in, the, in this, we, there is no way that we can compete with China in those countries. What we can do is to have enough presence with. Uh, lastly, sir, what is the future of India China relations, especially post Galwan? Uh, Indian government is insisting on a status quo ante uh, for any uh, further talks on any other issue. Uh, Chinese seems to suggest that whatever disengagement has happened, it is enough and we should move on. So where do we go from here? I disagree with you that the Chinese are not taking it seriously. As I, as I keep saying, even today, at a much higher military cost, they can take the entire area they want in Latak uh, within a matter of a week. We have seven or eight Rafale fighters there now. The Chinese have a, they, an equivalent to the Rafale, but they have 200 in the Western theater. Uh, there's a slight difference. Their avionics and their electronic warfare capabilities are as good or better than ours. But most important is on, on the terrain, on the ground. The terrain is all in their favor. I don't think there are any Chinese soldiers who are even remotely compared with ours in terms of individual bravery. But does that mean that we should sacrifice them? I mind you, what I'm saying about the bravery of the Indian Jawan, not and just an Indian talking out of a thing. This is these are the recorded observations of British and French officers who fought with and against Indian soldiers in the armies of the British, French, and the Mughals uh, in, in the 18th century. That is not their intention. We want peace. We need to do only one thing, sir and sir. Look at the agreement in the Pangong area. The key element in it was an agreement by both sides not to send their troops into the grey zone between the two lines of control. Now, that constitutes a de facto border belt. This is the beginning of, if one were to offer the same, pull back five kilometers, we pull back five kilometers and all these other places. we would probably be much, we would be much closer to a settlement with them, uh, you know, a permanent peace, uh, because that is basically all that they have been looking for, which they said that this is a way, if, if you keep sending more and more patrols, there's a constant presence, one way or the other. Patrols may be moving, but there's a constant presence. And you, you establish a border defect by claiming permanent presence in that area. And if we continue doing that, we will be at war with the Chinese for the war later. It stops beating the drum of nationalism work against China. It is simply too dangerous. Also, it does not serve India's long-term interest because it makes you a slave of a dying power. The more you do this, the more automatically you're on the side of the on the other side. And the less bargaining power you have in keeping your decisions independent of that other side. What will you suggest? China to do or for friendship or normalizing relationship with India? I think China should take 11 rounds have taken place in these discussions. I think the Chinese should in the next round make the proposal that look in the remaining areas, Gogra and, and let us do what we did in Pangong and move back five kilometers on each of both sides. You know, and um, if we do that, automatically the, the base, they have not moved their base areas anywhere close the line of control, they're still quite some distance away. But if the troops move out and leave this demilitarized border zone of roughly say 10 kilometers, in time they can sit down and work it out and make it like wider, work it out, fine tune it, 
let it develop organically through a series of discussions. This was specific to border issue. But how should China address India's concern on international issues such as UNSC, NSG and on terrorism? China deal with India. China, look, China has a key question that Mr. Modi has raised with China is that you're supporting one Pakistani terrorism by not declaring a Sudan uh, an international terrorist. And the second one is that uh, you have building, spending huge amounts of money on this economic corridor, super train, uh, under the hill, tunnel for about 30, 40 kilometers and so on, you know, connecting Pakistan thing. It's putting all this investment in an area that is disputed because it is POK and legally it belongs to us. The Chinese are not going to be impressed by that because if, if they accept that legally it belongs to us argument, then legally Aksai Chin belongs to India also. By the, the same 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 country, Britain drew both those lines. So the, the question is that that is an argument that will not fly. But the Indian government had accepted this a long time ago. And our policy with the Chinese was to continue developing relations while maintaining a caveat that remember that this is a disputed territory and should any change of status take place there, you, you need to prepare to deal with India. I mean, you know, say whatever arrangements will be there will be transferred to India should it, a change of situation arise there. That is the caveat that I don't know the exact words, but it can't be anything else. Uh, and we have done this many, many times in the past. Mr. Modi stopped this also. Basically, he had to show how strong Hindutva had been reborn and suddenly India overnight had become a major power. Thank you so much, sir. What an honor, a pleasure it was talking to you. Uh, you have cleared so many doubts and misperceptions about India-China relations, uh, which uh, our my viewers might have. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Because I, I think I, I would say one last thing to anybody who sees this. Thing. Make up your own minds. You've read a lot uh, in the papers. You've heard a lot on television. If you have heard me think about this for yourselves, I've also, I've also written a lot, lot on this in the wire and explained the, Ch the Chinese predicament. The most important thing to remember as, any dip as, a, as a very famous Indian diplomat told me once was, how do you represent your country in another country? Mm -hmm. He said to me, it is by explaining that country to your own foreigners. And this is why it is knowing your enemy, knowing what he wants, knowing what he, what he does not want, is the way to diffuse the enmity and to get advantage out of the relationship instead of of disadvantage. That's really all I would like to say. But thank you for giving me this opportunity.